as an ode to sort of like your love of punk music and my love of punk music. I'm trying to go for Axl Rose here, you know, like when he was doing. That's awesome. Hi everyone, Chowan here again. And today my guest, I heard about him a few weeks ago, but as soon as I heard about him, look at his blog, and just read other friends' posts, I was just like, oh, I need to interview him. This is Aiden Wachter, and he is a talismanic jewelry maker, and we'll talk more about what that is actually means but he's also written this book this lovely green book oh, I love the way it feels and it's called six ways approaches and entries for practical magic and it does exactly what it says I mean I read this book in about I don't know I'm gonna say like 48 hours it was an easy read totally just like marked and everything like that it was just I thought after reading this I wish I had read this a year ago and I'm pretty new to magic, but just the things that I learned, um, how clearly it was laid out, it was mind blown. So I am so excited to have Aiden with me here today. Hi, Aiden. Howdy. It's good to be here. You know, I see a guitar in the back in yep. your studio, and you mentioned going to punk rock shows and thinking, okay, like guitar, punk rock, talismanic jewelry, like it's all like melding together. First of all, what does that exactly mean? You're a talismanic jewelry maker. So, I got into jewelry through magic. Um, I've been practicing magic for about five years, seriously, when I moved to New Orleans. And uh, one day I woke up after being out drinking really late, because New Orleans, the bars don't really close, you know? So I'd probably been drinking till like, five. Mm -hmm. And I woke up at, like, eight with this, like, clear message that I had to ride my bike across town in the summer heat. Uh, still drunk and probably slightly hungover somewhere in between the two, uh, to this coffee shop that I'd found on the Tulane campus. And so I did this, because I by that time I already learned those impulses matter in magic. And uh, when I rolled up to that coffee shop on my bike, uh, I've got a lot of tattoos. Uh, I had my shirt off. I had hair that, then. I'm not sure what it was like. but And I rolled up, and there were these two probably 40-year-old punks is what I'm going to say. Uh, guy with really long hair, but crazy Buddhist tattoos, uh, and his wife. And uh, we kind of spotted each other immediately. They'd apparently been trying to get it together to go home for like an hour, but had been waiting for me. And so I rolled up and said, will you watch my bike and let me get a cup of coffee and we'll talk. And they were like, absolutely. Uh, and they were the first magicians I met in New Orleans. And it turned out that they were jewelers. Uh, and so years later, I learned jewelry from Mark, who's now, he, he passed, I guess, now two years ago. But um, I, I, later on, I learned jewelry from him. And uh, to me, talismanic jewelry is jewelry that is intended to be used for magical purposes. It's not that it stylistically looks a particular way, it's that it's created with an intention uh, to be a magical tool. What, what sort of um, benefits or what sort of effects would you get if you wore a talismanic piece of jewelry? It's going to depend upon the person and how they use it. These are active things. They're not, they're not passive. With magic, it, it, there's a lot that has to do with both the intention that goes into it and then the conscious working with it. So, like, I'm wearing specific jewelry that I would wear for something like talking to you. Uh, that's intention is to help me be clearer, maybe be able to infer what you're asking sometimes, and again, to be able to respond in a way that is uh, kind of appropriately transparent for who you and I are in this communication. So it's not like you wear it out. Like, if you're going to, like, a friend's house, you wouldn't wear that piece of jewelry. Right. If I was going to go teach or something, I would. Uh, you know, if I was actually looking to communicate about what I do, then certainly. Uh, but yeah, if I was just going to go hang out now, I've got my regular stuff I wear, uh, which is all talismanic, and that's more kind of to keep my allies close to me, and what I think of as uh, luck, not as lucky charm, 
kind of thing, but luck is a, as a tangible thing. And this is where kind of like my mind, it gets blown because a lot of people, they wear their lucky shirt or their lucky tie, you know, yeah. or like something that their grandma gave them. Um, and it's always their lucky thing, but the type of jewelry you make, it's not just about luck, right? It's actually working with lots of different magical elements. Right. Kind of my particular skill set or talent is that uh, I'm a really good channel for a lot of different energies or what you, spirits. You know, I'm an animist, and so I believe that we're surrounded by uh, lots of other beings that we can't generally, most of us can't generally see, um, that you can kind of form alliances with. And it will then help you out. Somebody can come in and go, I've got, usually it's kind of deep history stuff um, that is problematical that I'm trying to work through. And I would like a tool that would help me do that. And we can come up with something. That's that's kind of the specialty, if I have it for my custom work, is the people that come in and go, I know I need help with this. I don't know what that help will look like. I don't know what it is. Uh, and then it's a process of drawing out enough information from them that I can kind of tap into that current that would actually help them. Uh, and then build something for that. A kid who's starting a new band, let's say, and he wants to become like a big star, they can actually get a piece of jewelry made, custom made. Yep. That will help them be more, what is it, like get an agent, be more charismatic? It, it really depends because there, there's, and this is where magic gets kind of crazy and tricky and I think is confusing to people because we have a real Hollywood view of magic. Mm -hmm. Um and I know that you've talked to Jason Miller on here before. So it's not so much about what did I do wrong so much as, okay, that wasn't enchantable. How do we then move the board to make it more enchantable? Or so, I'm definitely in the Jason camp of being pragmatic. So like, well, what's the deal? Are they really good? Because if they're really good, that helps. If they're not so good, that might be step one, right? <laughs> right. Uh, if they're really beautiful and they're really good, well, then they've got two steps in the right thing. And it, so you kind of look at what the reality of that situation is, if they're looking to become a rock star or something. And then it becomes, yeah, can we get you connections? Not necessarily who you think it is that would be good, a good match for you, but could we kind of get your allies, because they have allies, everybody has allies, to hook you up with somebody that might really dig you, that has some influence. Uh, I think of uh, this band that I really love, Kaya. Who uh, eventually morphed into the Queens of the Stone Age. Uh, they were this little tiny desert band. They got signed, but Metallica took them on the road with them for months because they really loved them. And that made Caius, right? You couldn't pick that. They would never go, we want Metallica to take us on the road. This was a purely organic thing. And so a lot of magic is, can we swing the flow towards these organic coincidences or circumstances? Uh, and there's never a guarantee, but it, it does work. Uh, and it tends to work in pretty peculiar ways. As a former hardline, hardcore atheist, it's still difficult for me to accept that, you know, like something can be created and it's not just like good intentions, but actual sentient spirits that you're working right. with that are helping create this jewelry. And one of the things that you're book it helped me understand was the concept of that right like mm -hmm. when you were younger you had first-hand experiences with spirits so it's not just like you read it in a book you you know right right that was yeah i think that, that was one of the things that you know i have a, a somewhat peculiar take on all this stuff that's pretty clear in the book um and i think a lot of it is because i came at things backwards for most people that most of the magicians when I, that I first met as I started playing, uh, kind of in that field, were trying to get stuff to happen. Like, they really wanted to believe, and they really wanted these particular experiences to happen. Uh, 
where I was more trying to slow them down. <laughs> I would like these to be more relaxed. I, I, I don't, I'm not against having things that I don't know what they are, communicate with me or whatever, but I don't want it to be intense. I don't want it to be crazy. I don't want it to kind of blow up my life. But I think it is a strange thing in the modern world because it's we're, we're handed this kind of, um, you know, in America at least, we're handed this, uh, the U.S., I picked up that habit too and it's terrible, but... In the U.S., um, we kind of have Christianity and everything else. And so there's this particular model that you have God, and depending on your view of Christianity, then you have the other God, which is the bad God, right? Satan, whatever you want to call it. Um, and that's it. There's no space in between there. Maybe if you're a Catholic, you get saints, which are another level in here. But all that is really unusual in human history. And, and if you look anywhere else where we didn't, it isn't based upon that kind of Abrahamic, Judeo-Christian roots, Islamic roots, there were spirits everywhere. Uh, and some of these you could work with, and some of them you couldn't, and some of them you just had to try and stay out of their way because they would cause problems. Uh, and I think that that's, the, that's closer to the reality. I don't know what really is going on. What I like about your book is that it's outlining a very practical and simple way to start working with spirit. You first start out by talking about, you know, like, let's first talk about worldview. And let's right. try to imagine that it doesn't just have to be one way. That sounds right. super non-dualistic, Zen. I mean, do you come from a Buddhist background at all? I have spent some time around some Buddhism. Um, and I think that the Buddhist kind of psychological model is the most accurate model of the human psyche I've found. Uh, so in six ways, I recommend a couple of Buddhist books. Um, because I think it gives... To me, it's pretty evident when you get into that stuff that you go, if I really just do a little bit of meditation and sit with these concepts, I can see how they play out in me. Unlike Western psych for me, which has never really gelled. Like I go, ah, eh, this is a little bit too much talk. Uh, this is a little too much theory. It's not, I can't pragmatically see how all the pieces go together. But so there's definitely that influence. Um, but I also think that my worldview opens me to that influence. Yeah. That there's no convincing it really had to happen. I read that stuff and going, oh yeah, I can see that that's going on. I'm a little bit jealous because I'm definitely somebody who wants that firsthand experience. But the way that you explained it, like I think the first couple of chapters, it was like every single line I underlined, I was just like, oh yeah, <laughs> you know? Like, you know, just imagine, just try to imagine that it doesn't just have to be, you know, like the five senses and what scientific equipment that you have that can prove it. Just try to be a little bit more open. And you do it in a, in a way that is kind of palpable, I think, for skeptics. Because you're kind of easing us into it. And then what I really enjoyed was that you spend a lot of time talking about things that we can actually do with our energy bodies. Like right. first steps. Can you talk more about that? To me, that's the... It's kind of the easy way in. Um is to kind of, and I, I talk about this in the book somewhat too, is the first way to go to kind of think about spirits is to realize that they are not necessarily super different than you are. Uh, and that therefore, what is true about you, in some ways, uh, you know, minus the body in most cases, uh, could well be true about them. And that this is a two-way street as far as its usefulness. If you treat yourself more like a spirit being, you can get more done magically. Uh, and then if you treat them more in the way that you would like to be treated as a person, they tend to reciprocate a lot harder. And one of the ways that this really works for me is using that energy body, using breath work, using the microcosmic orbit that I talk about in the book, really basic stuff. And it has a couple of functions. It kind of slows you down from kind of our crazy modern grind, uh, way too much going on and 
I don't have the flippy phone, but, uh, you know, uh, I do the same thing on my laptop. Uh, I'm just hunting for stimulus, right? Uh, and gets you to settle back into your body and go, okay, what's going on? And if we take many, many thousands of years explanations as being at least somewhat true or potentially true, we can go, okay, are there energy channels that I can sense in my body? Can I make those clearer to me? Uh, can I become more aware of them? Can I play with them? Uh, can I send that around to other parts of my body? Or could I relax myself so much that I'm not really aware of my body without it being weird at all? Uh, you have the friends that like uh, ask you a question and you start talking and they immediately just tune out and go somewhere else. And so they like know that they should engage, but they can't. That's where most of us are as it relates to kind of the spirit world or to magic. Even if we have the sense that this is something we would like to do, there's so much kind of distraction and noise that it's really hard to, to get in there. I think it's also kind of tricky. Like Jason's one of those people that can see stuff really clearly and really easily. He talks about it in, in his books. And I'm not that guy. So I've had to go, I've had to learn that kind of the communications I get from spirit are really subtle. And so I have to be really paying attention. I can't be... Uh, I can't be fucking around. I have to kind of go, okay, if something strange pops into my mind that I don't, that doesn't seem like something that would normally pop into the mind, that might be somebody trying to tell me something. And so I have to be ready to kind of follow that, that trail. Uh, and again, I think the Hollywood thing and then the fact that a lot of magicians are really blessed with ease of seeing can really kind of screw with people who are new because they assume I should be able to do this ritual and then the spirit appears in front of me and I talk to it. It's like, nah, that's, that happens for a few people. Uh, but that's not the norm and it's not required. For most of us, it's probably more work than it's worth. Uh, you know, it's kind of like I'm going to become a race car driver so I can drive around town. It's like, it's just, do you, right. what's, what's, where's the, what's the cost-benefit analysis look like there? Right. And the yeah. techniques that you lay out in your book are things that everyday people can do. There's no special stuff that we need to buy, yeah. robes. We don't have to do any of that. It, this is always one of those sketchy places because I don't ever wish to like diss anybody for their approach because I think all of the approaches that work are valid, right, by mm -hmm. definition. Um but when I first got into magic, one of the things that was really interesting is I was living in uh, the Bay Area, and I was living in Berkeley. Uh, and this was kind of a hotbed for the neo-pagan scene. Mm. Uh, so I started going out to public rituals. And it was super kind of Renaissance fair hippie. Yes. Mm -hmm. And this makes total sense. Marion Zimmer Bradley, kind of a hugely famous author, science fiction writer who wrote The Mists of Avalon, was also a pagan. Her house was in Berkeley, Greyhaven, and a whole chunk of the pagan community was tied into her. Uh, the Covenant of the Goddess, which I think is still one of the biggest uh, Wiccan groups, started in San Francisco for a bunch of people who were... Uh, that came out of the New Reformed Orthodox Order of the Golden Dawn, or Nerud, which I think came out of like a Morris dancing group in the Bay Area. So this is another kind of folklore, you could throw it out there, not though it's inaccurate, but kind of Ren Ferry hippie crew, right? Diana Paxson, who runs Rothnar and does really amazing work with Norse, uh, seething trances, Seder. Uh, she's the, her backyard is where the Society for Creative Anachronism starts. So this is all a particular vibe, right? That I roll into my first one of these things in a leather jacket and big boots with my head shaved. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I'm not sure I should be here. It's <laughs> a change. But at that point in time, I was definitely like the one freaky punk in this whole scene. Like one of the things that you stress in your book is that, you know, this individual approach in terms of when you're building an altar or you're trying to create a magical space, it's what looks magical 
to you. Right. And the fact that you also are kind of saying, yes, visuals are important. That witch aesthetic that so many magic people love to shit on, saying, you know, yeah. oh, if you just look the part of a witch, you know, like that automatically like kind of disqualifies you. It kind of like makes you kind of airheaded that you're so into the aesthetics. But a lot of young women, they come into magic because of the aesthetics. I'm, I'm all on the aesthetic side. I come, again, punk rock, rock and roll. Right. right? There's a lot of aesthetic in that whole thing. Uh, and I'm down with that. I think it's excellent. I'm not one of the people that goes, these guys look silly. It's like, they might look silly, but if, it, if it's how it works for them to do the, what they want to do and portray what they want to portray, there's power in that. It's like if you were going to go out to meet someone that you were interested in, you're going to make your best right. foot forward uh, to present yourself in a way that works for you. And this is, again, as most of us have had bad faux pas early on, you try and do it to work for the other person, right? That's what you first learn. Uh, as you go, okay, what do I think girls would like to see or guys would like to see, right? right? And that never flies because it's not real, right? And then at some point you go, okay, I want to look good for me. And if I look good for me, this will be, this will find me the guy that I look good for, right? Uh, there, we don't, this doesn't have to be a, a one-way street. And I think that that's totally true in magic. We want to, we're after a connection to ourselves first that reflects what we're trying to do. You're a spiritual being, they're a spiritual being, but like you mentioned, you're in a body. So I'm thinking if I'm going to meet a friend and we're going to a nice restaurant or if I want to show the friend that, you know, I made an effort for you, I'm not going to show up in sweats and like greasy hair. Totally. totally. You know, I'm going to dress up and I'm going to come with good energy. And one of the things you talk about is meditation, trance work, and before this book, I didn't really know the difference between the two. But can you explain what the difference is between meditation and trance? There's a, there's a ton of different kinds of meditation. And again, this is where we get kind of, we get screwed by the, the, the new age, as you said, some, some aspects there. But what we really get messed up with is who got a hold of the early Buddhist and uh, Hindu texts. Uh, so this was, uh, you know, we have people like Arthur Avalon, uh, who did the, some of the earlier translations about the, the Hindu stuff. We get Crowley for Buddhist stuff. And then we get kind of the whole scene that came out of the 50s and 60s. Uh, and so we have very specific interpretations of particular pieces of Buddhism in, in the U.S. as being the whole thing. Uh, and I think that that's where the meditation can get really confusing because really the meditation is just about kind of getting a handle on your mind and there's a whole lot of ways you can do this. And so again, kind of when we're dealing with magic as a spirit based thing where communication is important, we want to be clear and we want to be clear about what we're hearing. And so meditations. The first step is, can we shut up some of the noise, right? The thing that I talk about is being the discursive mind. If you sit down, close your eyes, and breathe, your mind is going to go crazy. But this isn't anything new. This is going on all the time, right? It's only kind of annoying when you have some sense that you should stop it. <laughs> Otherwise, it's telling stories, it's singing songs, it's deciding whether you pick the right clothes, it's deciding... All of these things continuously. And this is just what the mind does. Is it describes what's going on. And if nothing's going on, it describes what it thinks might be going on or could be going on or what went on in the past. And it really never stops. <laughs> uh, and so meditation allows us to, to turn the volume down on all of that chatter uh, so that we can maybe go, okay, what do I really want for me right now? And that's kind of step one in magic, right? Because it's about what do we want? Can we have it? Could we make that happen? Um, and so meditation, I would say, is just about kind of quieting the chatter and getting clear with our own minds. And then trance work, 
kind of follows on that, which is, can we relax the body to such a degree and quiet the mind to such a degree that we can begin to, there's no good word for this, but travel or project ourselves into alternative spaces. Uh, and these are not necessarily real uh, in the sense that they're tangible. It's like if I go to any of the places that I go to in trance, these are not material places. And they're probably, as far as what I'm perceiving, psychological constructs. Uh, but they are, that construct is a, is a form of language between the spirit world and myself so that I can actually operate there. Self-hypnosis is a really excellent way to get into trance. Uh, but there's a difference. I think there is, yeah. In self-hypnosis, you're generally trying to uh, produce particular effects. And as I use trance, I'm interested in getting into particular spaces, but then I don't want to control what happens. Uh, because I'm a spirit worker, I want to get into a space where I can have uh, an interaction with spirits that could be helpful to me. There's a lot of really extensive guided meditation books in the New Age that kind of walk you through every step. You meet the spirit, it looks like this, you do that. That's fine, but that it kind of precludes you having your own experience because it's already laid out. What if that's not the thing that you need to meet? Uh, what if the thing that you need to meet is, I don't know, some kind of toad-like creature uh, is how it presents the first, right? It's unattractive. It's uninteresting. You're strange. Uh, but it actually could help you with your actual individual problems or the blocks that you have. Uh, or it has information that would be useful to you. Uh, and then what if the next time you come back, you meet that same thing, but it looks like a 12-year-old girl? Uh this is not something you see discussed a lot, and this is something that's very common in my experience, that you kind of learn to recognize these spirits, not by their appearance, it's like we recognize each other, uh, since we're embodied and we don't change that much, but you go, oh, I know who you are. Uh, you're that thing that last time was kind of like a rock. <laughs> so like, this almost yeah. sounds like you're doing what you do when you're dreaming, but mm -hmm. you're awake while you're doing it. That's a, that's a really good uh, take, I think. Um, and I think uh, there's a definitely an aspect of that, except when you start getting consistent in your trance work, and like anything else, you know, the, the kind of, if there's a big message in the book, it's, it's, it's go deep rather than wide, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Is what I would say. Yeah. Uh, and so if you pick a few places to go in the trance world or one place to go and you go consistently it's going to take on a particular, its particular nature. Uh, and so unlike a dream, which is some of this is definitely going on in our dream states, but it's also we're processing the day, we're processing all sorts of stuff. We're processing the temperature in the room, uh, right? It's, uh, it, many people that have nightmares discover that you only have nightmares when it's hot or when you are hot. If you have nightmares, turn down the temperature. Uh, and you'll probably not have nightmares anymore. So it's moving that biological side out in the trance world. But yeah, in the magical trance, you can go in and go find your ally and go, I'm having a problem. Why do I always meet crazy girls? <laughs> what is it about like crazy <laughs> girls that makes me, that, that, that that's what I'm attracted to? Because that's not what I want to be in a relationship with. And often you can find allies that can kind of go, okay, this is what you're doing to draw that to you, or this is the aspect of this. So there's an aspect that is, sometimes it's psychotherapy, sometimes it's really crazy Hollywood magic. You know, I think a lot of people, they've tried meditation, it's hard, whatever. They're willing to do that, though. Maybe they're not ready yet to go into the trance thing, mm -hmm. but things that they can do immediately is start giving offerings to spirits. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, like, literally, anybody can do this. Like, you can go to the grocery store or, like, the CVS or whatever tonight and, like, get the uh, products, the ingredients, and you can, like, start giving offerings right away. What are right. offerings and why are they so important? In the book, I talk about offerings as being in – I talk about in relationship to uh, 
human relationships. That, um, you know, if you were in New Mexico and I was not married, uh, <laughs> perhaps we met somewhere, right? Uh, and then I could go, I would really like to hang out with her. So, again, I would see if I could get you to hang out with me, and then I might bring you something, right? It wouldn't have to be anything big, or I might buy you dinner, right? Mm -hmm. These are offerings, uh, and the same thing kind of goes uh, in magic, that if I want to have a better relationship with the allies that are already around me, kind of step one is I acknowledge that they're there, Right? And the best way to do that and to say, I know you're real, is to give them something real. Uh, and so, in my case, I'm really simple on offering. It's like water, it's coffee, it's hard candies, it's food. Um, you know, there's an egg back there because one of the spirits I work with really likes eggs and we have chickens. So, mm -hmm. he gets fresh eggs pretty re regularly. And to me, it's a way of giving thanks and giving energy to the relationship and a way of making it tangible. And so I want it to be something that I can touch because I want that interaction with them to be something that I can touch. I'm looking for tangible results uh, in my world, so I want to give real things. So that's the, that's the main trick with offerings is you're trying to produce a real effect. And the easiest way to do that is to give real things. These spirits, they don't have bodies. Mm -hmm. what benefit like a lot of law of attraction people are just like you just have to think good thoughts and I'm thinking okay well if these are spirits and they don't have a body then shouldn't the thought be enough I don't know it's an interesting thing um, I was talking to, to Lonnie last week on his podcast and, what and that becomes a huge portion of the ritual uh, that's that it kind of almost replaces ritual work that's the offerings, if I was going to, if that's the sell for the offerings, if I was going to try and sell you on offerings, which I am. <laughs> and one of the things that I brought up is, why do we talk to them? They don't have bodies, so they don't have ears. <laughs> right. Um, so they can't hear us in the way that we hear. I, it's one of those things that I didn't do for a long time, I think, because I really had kind of, like, what's the value? Yeah. And then at some point I went, but I burn pretty nice incense, and I consecrate candles with pretty nice oils, uh, but some of which I get custom made for particular things, you know, by people who are good at it rather than me doing it on my own. Um, are these things not offerings? Right? If I'm lighting this, a candle for the spirit, that's absolutely an offering, uh, and is one of the best offerings because it's you're turning something material into something immaterial. And so that one's a pretty easy transfer. So if people can't see anything else, you could go give, give candles. Uh, burn a candle for, the, the, for your allies. Uh, in the book, I kind of give the repeating thing. Of, you know, uh, my, my, I walk into the shop every morning, and the first thing that I do is I light a candle for the spirits that aid in gardening, that there may be peace between us all of our days. And that's like the most basic offering you could do. Uh, and then I give them water. Again, why water? I don't know, but it's it's absolutely effective. And that's a big part, of, I think, of my approach too. Is there's a point that I don't care. Uh, I don't. I have an understanding of how the internal combustion engine works, but I don't know how it works in my Kia. It just works. Uh, <laughs> it works. For whatever reason, this popped into my head. You know, like when you bring donuts for your coworkers, and it's like everybody's gonna take a donut, including you know Sally that you hate. But then, you know, yeah. somebody's going to be nice to you that day because you brought donuts. Yeah. It, it's kind of like that, right, when you're offering. Absolutely. So, and that's one of the things that both Jason and I talk about, too, is you make offerings for the things that tend to be in your way. Because if you do, they tend to stop being in your way. <laughs> and it's like that person at the office that you're cool to because you learn that if you start, if, if you, if you want to engage in the war, Mm. you will always be at war, right? right. Uh, but if you're willing to instead go, hey, dude, do you want a donut? <laughs> Every once in a while, they might completely back off and go, okay, don't like you, but I don't need to try and get you uh, on the boss's shit list anymore. Let's say that you're just like, you know what? 
I don't want to be visited by some toad spirit, right? I just want to lay yeah. out like water and a tea light. And I'm just going to lay it out with like cool intentions, right? Yeah. Spirits, you know, partake in this. You know, I got your back. You got my back. Cool, cool. If you do that consistently, is that magic? Absolutely. It's magic because, in my mind, what you're going to see if you do it sincerely and consistently is things are going to change. And magic is about change. I met people that have tried the offering thing but really were against the whole idea. So they weren't into it, right? And so now you've got the guy that you're trying to buy off at the office that knows that you're trying to buy him off, right? Yeah. It's not going to have the same effect. There's no sincerity there. But... Uh, I don't know anybody that's kind of sincerely done an offering practice for a couple of months that hasn't been like, I'm not dropping that. That's my life is better. Uh, so yeah, it's absolutely magic. And like the next level you can do from that is giving offerings to your ancestors. And that's right. super interesting to me. Korea, I'm living in Korea right now and mm -hmm. there's two holidays, national holidays, the biggest holidays in Korea where literally the entire nation uh, worships their ancestors. Why is that so important? <laughs> I keep thinking this, is, this, this particular comment is going to come up in one of the interviews that I do, and so this is a great time for it to come up. One of the things that you get a lot in the modern world as an argument against kind of magical practices is Occam's razor, right? Hmm. Uh, and this is used as an argument for materialism, right? This is the simple thing. We can see it. We can touch it. So most likely that that's all that's there. From what we know of historical reality, and especially like China, Korea, Japan, places that have not been as Christianized or that have happened later, uh, is everyone has done this. Uh, this is the most common thread between kind of all spiritual practices uh, that I've ever seen anywhere. You see this, whether this is in the Pacific Islands, whether this is uh, Aboriginal folks in Australia, whether this is uh, Native folks in America, whether this is African religion. Uh, most everybody that we have record of has performed some form of ancestor veneration. Right. Uh, and it, until I looked at it that way, I was like, my ancestors are like Mayflower Puritans <laughs> on one half of the family. I want nothing to do with these yeah. people. <laughs> They're totally the antithesis of what I'm into, and they are, were first wave of the kind of native genocide, right, uh, in the U.S. Why would I want to connect to that? Yeah. Um, but the reality is, is that the ancestor line isn't the family that you know about necessarily. It's the whole line. And so you're looking at, what, a couple million years now, they say that we are basically as we were. Uh, you know, uh, that's a whole lot of history of that kind of practice and connection for any of us to tap into. I've got a, a, a little shrine up here that I'm looking at that's about this big. Um, because it works better when I do. Uh, my life runs better when on Sunday I give them candles, I give them a light, I give them uh, incense. Uh, I'm the least Christian person you could ever meet, uh, and I read psalms to them on Sundays. And then that's that. I don't have any further interaction with them 99% of the time. Uh, but it's what, again, it's kind of like making the general offerings. You do that for six months or so, and you don't tend to stop, because it clearly works. It clearly improves things. There's a lot of theory on it, which is just saying that they're close to you. They're the spirits that are uh, directly linked to you, whether you know who they are or not. I mean, people go, well, how do I do this if I'm adopted? So you don't have to know who they are. That's an irrelevancy. Um, again, we don't know who 99.9% .9 of our ancestors were because nobody knows who those people were. The idea is, is because their blood relationship, whether you know them or not, whether you liked them or not, they kind of have your back by default, even if they didn't when they were alive. And then also kind of working with the ancestors is believed to be incredibly helpful 
and this one makes sense to me, because they know what your life is like. Maybe not individually, but they know what it's like to be a human living here. Uh, and so they tend to be very helpful in that part. That makes sense to me. So the ancestor altar would be separate from the general offerings? For me it is. Uh, and that's, I think that's usually recommended. Um, now I have two ancestral connections that I don't treat like ancestors, that I treat as kind of familiar spirits, because they came out totally separately. Uh, that they showed up and basically said, okay, we are, of, you're of our line, uh, and all of the rest of these people that would like to talk to you don't matter, uh, <laughs> which is pretty odd. It's a, I mean, I don't know. I assume it's odd. I haven't talked to a lot of people about that side of it. But they, very, they definitely are, and I think that they're very old. Uh, and I think my guess is that it's the last magicians in my bloodline. And so to them, they're like, you know, fuck all the Puritans. Those people were never on our side. Uh, and But we would, there's work that you have to do in this life, and we would like to help you with that. Uh, and that's my belief on who they are. And you connected with these specific ancestors during trans right. work? Yes. Yeah. They, I, was, I was doing some general trans work, dealing with the ancestors with uh, Bruce Saucy. Uh, and uh, what was supposed to happen was that you would kind of meet the, the family of your ancestors in this place. And that happened. They showed up. I could see my grandparents because they're all gone. And uh, great grandparents, this whole sea of people. And this guy just kind of walked through, and they all parted, and put his hands on me and said, This isn't really for you, but we can help you. And kind of presented himself as the representative of, I would say, this kind of magical lineage. And that was one of the major shifts that's happened in my life uh, recently in the last few years. This was about three or four years ago now. I'm getting a better picture now of sort of how you do magic. So it doesn't have to be this big extravagant affair. It's just like every day putting out offerings and yeah. then also like when you want to connect to them like spirit to spirit, going from meditation yep. to trance. And this right. is something that everybody can do and I think that's one of the reasons why I just kind of inhaled this book I was like oh you know like I can literally start doing this tonight you know absolutely you can just literally and, start you know, doing it tonight. and the book came about in a really interesting way that I got I'd written some blog posts and had lots of little bits and pieces that I put together and Scrivener kind of going someday this will become a book and then I hurt myself in a way that I couldn't work and I knew I was going to be out of work for at least a couple of weeks. I went into trance, and the book started coming. Uh, and I was like, oh, I'm writing a book, like, right now. <laughs> uh, In trance, I, you wrote the book? or when No, you got but, I, but that's what the impetus was. And I, like, woke up, from, I came out of the trance, and instead of going to bed, grabbed my computer and started writing the book. And so that's kind of why the book is dedicated to the spirits, because they were hugely involved in the whole process of like, no, this is, we would like people to know how to do this in a way that doesn't necessarily involve, you know, demonology or ritual magic or having to try and understand Aleister Crowley, or that it's not necessarily witchcraft. It's not necessarily a particular religious structure, that this is, uh, these are practices that are available to us as as what I call human spirit beings in the book. I think that there's a lot of folks that feel kind of pushed out and often really are pushed out by the greater magical community because they want you to fit in. Well, what are you? Are you a ceremonial magician? Are you a chaos magician? Are you a witch? Because I only talk to some of those people and they're only if they're cool enough, right? And that's all bullshit. That's a bunch of crap. Uh, these, are, these are our functional practices that anyone can do. I'm thinking, okay, let's think of a hypothetical situation. Let's say a writer. Mm -hmm. You talked about you got out of trance and you were like, oh, I'm going to write this book. Let's mm -hmm. say we have this young woman. Uh, she uh, is having massive writer's block. Mm -hmm. 
she's open to doing some of this sort of magic, you know, like you talk about meditation, trance work, you talk about chakras. These are things that are kind of mainstream now, you know, when she goes to yoga, they talk about chakras. She's okay with that. What are some things that she could start doing right away for the next, let's say 30 to 60 days? And what sort of results can she expect from doing those things? You know, step one that I recommend for me, and we just started it in the Six Ways group on Facebook, is what's in the book, The Reclaiming Right. Um, And it's also up on my blog. So people, if they're interested in this, you don't have to buy the book. You can go to my blog uh, and uh, do a look through there, and you'll find The Reclaiming Right. And that's a really simple five-minute ritual that you can do every day that begins to kind of ungunk the system. Uh, It's a really simple process. It's the first step is you forgive yourself for all of your failures, all that you've made and all that you will, because there's no reason to carry that around, right? It's a failure. It happened. It's done. You can't do shit about it. It will happen again. It's done. So move on. And then the second step is, uh, drawing back personal power that you've given away or it's been taken from you or most of us it's a lot of it has been taken away whether it's abusive relationships or abusive family dynamics or abusive workplace all of these things have pretty radical effects on us that we usually aren't aware of so drawing your power back begins to go okay this is mine it doesn't have to hang out with the people i don't like it doesn't have to hang out with my family that doesn't like what i do i don't have to leave that with the people that don't approve of me I can keep that. Uh, And it's drawing that energy back to you. And then the third part is actually blessing yourself, which is functionally a consecration. Let's seal that. Uh, I accept that this is real. I accept that I'm a a kind of a powerful person, a powerful being. uh, And we're going to work from that position now. That's a great step one. And what it should do, and what most people find doing it every day, either once or twice a day, is that those things happen. It does clear your mind. It clears shit. Somebody starts giving you a bad time in a way that would previously have really messed up your day. And it's not as big of a deal. This is a really simple thing, but it's a big thing. In our hypothetical, the second thing I would do is begin courting the spirit of the book. Uh, Spirit of the book. Or the spirit of writing. Like your muse. Like, Okay, you got one. If you're a writer, if you're an artist of any kind, make offerings to your art and to the spirit of your art. Uh, And again, it's a reciprocal relationship. You begin that process. It's going to begin feeding you back something. And sometimes it's not the thing that you expect or the thing that you want. Uh, So it could be that your sensibility is that you're a writer and you're a serious scholarly writer. Uh, you might find that you're a fiction writer, really, but that that's never been an acceptable option for you for whatever reason. Uh, And this is kind of, we talk about magic happening in weird ways a lot, uh, those of us that have been at it for a long time. And these are the things that that this usually means, is you go, oh, I've been working on this book on the Second World War or something, or some aspect of the history of nursing, but now I'm writing this novel. (laughs) And... What is that? It's like, well, you've connected with the reality of this. It's, as I talked about in the book, you could make petitions for help with that. Uh, you could make sigils for it to help with that. There's lots of simple ways that you can kind of speed that up, uh, which could be like, I write easily. If it's somebody that's got writer's block, I write easily a thousand words a day. Uh, it's no problem ever. Uh, And you begin kind of feeding this information into yourself. You work a lot with sigils when making talismanic jewelry. I do. So can you explain more? What are sigils? I know it's hard to explain something that's kind of visual, but what are they? A sigil is a a statement about something that you would like to have happen. This uh, This is a specific take on sigil. A sigil means a sign, so it could be all sorts of things. But in the sense I'm talking about it, it's a... having an idea that you want something, phrasing this in a way that is most likely to have a positive outcome, which is a little bit of a tricky game, and then turning that into an image. 
I teach a letter form, which is derived from Austin Square in the book, where you uh, actually write out what it is that you desire, uh, and you turn it into an image. So that's one. Uh, and this was a sentence uh, that is now this sigil. You know, I've made sigils before, and to be honest, they haven't worked that well for me. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. why it is. So it's not just that you can just draw the, the sigil and then you're done. There must be some step that I'm missing or something that I'm just not imbuing with enough magic. I can talk to my method on it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's better if you don't know what it's for. That's the most useful trick. And it's the one that is theoretically kind of difficult. Uh, because obviously you're doing it for things that you want, right? So here's the, like, Sigil Magic 105 or something. Uh, and I totally give this to Gordon White for that concept of creating shoals of sigils. And a shoal of sigils is really just a group of sigils that work together. Uh, and kind of tend to manifest together, even though they're not all for the same thing necessarily. And so how I do sigils for this, and you could try this, is uh, create a file on your computer that is everything that you want, that you would do magic for, and turn every one of those into a statement of intent. Uh, so, and you want to preferentially, this is just from experience, I don't know why it works, uh, you want to define it as already having happened in a way that you like. So you don't say, I want to move to Manhattan. You want to say, I love that I live in Manhattan. Right? For you to live in Manhattan and love it, you have to have moved. So that's kind of the phraseology. Uh, create a file on your computer and just run these phrases in it. When you want to do magic, you could pick a, a day of the week or just every once in a while. Uh, take the first 10 of those off uh, and uh, create the sigils from them. The better way to do it is to periodically pull 10 of them off. And you know the sigil process where you remove multiple level, letters. Do all of that. Copy them down backwards so that they're harder to link to what they were for. And put them on a 3 by 5 card and just put them in your drawer. Uh, just the letters that are left over. And do this periodically. So you always have in your drawer 3 by 5 card that's got 5 or 10 little collections of letters. So then make your sigils from those once you don't know what they are. Uh. So you're literally creating something that you can't link to the actual statement. You know kind of what they're for, right? Because they're the things that you want. But you couldn't say, I couldn't know, I've got 35 sigils on the wall over here, and I could not tell you what any one of them are for. Uh, I know some of them are for the book to do well. Uh, I know some of them are for the jewelry shop side of things to do well. I know some of those are for health and healing for friends of mine that have been sick. But I couldn't tell you which one is which. Uh, and then you charge them after that. Uh, so that you're separate from them. Uh, you're just treating it. All you know about this little guy is that this little guy is special, and you want to make it more special. I tend to uh, either take them to the walls in big streams or put them in a box in big piles and draw them like tarot cards. So I go in, I pull the sigils out of the box, I grab five or ten of them, and I lay them out and try and read them using my thinking like I'm reading cards. I don't know what they mean, uh, they're just nonsense little symbols that I know are powerful. I do find that they work better if they're out. If you're seeing them all the time, they work better, but not if you know what they are. So you kind of have to come up with some process to disassociate knowing what they're about. I do love the book that I mean, guys, the cover it just feels so amazing. Isn't it great? <laughs> yeah, I love it. That cover feels so great. And you know, I have to say, like getting the book and being able to annotate it, it's been super helpful as well. So I kind of recommend the book. Yeah. Um, but if they first want to look on your website, they can do that. They can also look on lots of different websites. You can just Google, like, shoaling. Yeah, absolutely. Gordon White's yeah. website has a ton of stuff. Yeah, his stuff is great. So runesuit.com is his website, and it's fabulous. Yeah, there's so many resources to find things that 
you know, if you're spooked out by other things, you can start off with the meditation, and you can start off with the sigils. You can start off with just giving offerings, the candle and the clear glass of water. It doesn't have to be super intense. You don't have to get, like, a dagger and, like, use your menstrual blood, you know, like, right away. <laughs> you don't have to do that. It doesn't, and it doesn't ever have to go there. And that's, I think, one of the things that people think. And you've, you've been, if, if you've been playing for a little while on this, people talk a lot about, oh, yeah, that's really one-on-one, or that's, like, baby witch stuff, right? You, you, you fuck y'all. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, uh, this is about what works for you. Uh, and what works for you may be entirely different than what works for me. I've known a ton of magicians. 90% of them have very small practices. They've found a particular ritual, or that doing a full moon ritual uh, a month is all that they do, or that they do just few offerings. And then occasionally things get wonky, they'll do a sigil for it. But it doesn't have to be a super involved thing. Due to what I do for a living, it's a kind of continuous thing for me. But if I wasn't actually doing continuous magical work for people, essentially, it wouldn't be as as, uh, in-depth as it is now. So Aiden, what are three songs that would be a great representation of your magic. <laughs> yeah. um, this was really hard. <laughs> Only three. Like a total music freak, as you know. There's three that I, I did pick, though it's hard. Uh, Stay Clean by Motorhead. <laughs> Because I think that that's like, that's the song that has represented my main kind of life lesson. Uh, Like, you do what you do, and you don't worry about it. Number two. Dirt Floor by Chris Whitley. As the dirt shall be open, as there's a dirt floor underneath. Dirt Floor is a song that he wrote about death. I'm basically saying, like, you know, when, don't be afraid of when this is done. There's no more struggle when it's done. And so just relax into it. And a lot of the work that I do is with uh, the spirits of the dead, uh, personally. This is one of the things that goes on in trance a lot for me, is that I help people who are stuck in between the worlds, that are not comfortable with the fact that they've had a change of state and so they are stuck somewhere. And so I can sometimes help those people move along. And then the last one is a song called Old Black by a band called Earth. It's an instrumental song. Uh, but it sounds like what magic sounds like to me. I know a lot of you guys are saying, this is cool, but I really don't want to do, like, I don't want to, like, spend $500 on crystals. I don't want to spend $700 on incense. Just get some tea lights. Get, like, a glass of water, and you can just start right away. And try it for 30 to 60 days. Um, Try the sigils. Look it up. If it doesn't work, Email Aiden, yell at him. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen to Earth and let us know what you think about them too. Aiden, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. Again, it's like this book is so practical. I'm almost thinking that if you're an artist of any kind, and if you're an artist, you're just naturally magical, and you want to start doing magic, but you're not ready to jump off into all that Harry Potter stuff yet want to go into something that works, that's effective, that's powerful, and something that you can do to help your art. I think this would be a great present for a musician, a writer, a painter, any artist like that. I think that's probably true, and I would agree with that. Thank you again. Thank you for having me.